Hi, everyone, and welcome to another Authors at Google event up in the San Francisco office. Today, we're very pleased to welcome Stephanie Palmer to Google. Uh, Stephanie's a former Hollywood executive, former denizen of Los Angeles as well, who's now um, gone to just as sunny climbs in Santa Fe, but maybe slightly calmer. Um, she used to be a Hollywood studio executive with MGM, and now she is uh, a pitching and presentation consultant. And she wrote a book called Good in a Room, which she'll reference today. Um, which is how to sell yourself and your ideas and win over any audience. She's been featured on the Today Show, on NBC, the early show on CBS, the Los Angeles Times, National Public Radio, and in Atlantic and Incorporated magazines. Please welcome Stephanie Palmer to Google. Have you ever had what you thought was a big idea only when you shared it with someone else, they didn't really get it? Or have you made a presentation in a meeting that fell flat? Or you have a really great idea and you share that with your supervisor only to have them not pursue it? So let's be honest. Sometimes ideas are not that good. But sometimes you have a really great idea, but it doesn't get the financing or the attention that it deserves. So why does this happen? This happens for the same reason that Hollywood makes so many bad movies. Now, of course, there are plenty of reasons why Hollywood makes lots of bad movies, but one of the main reasons happens early in the process when they're deciding which projects they want to purchase. So Hollywood producers and executives hear hundreds of pitches before they decide which select few are going to be those best bets. And those best bets often aren't the best ideas, but they are likely to be the best pitches. So here's the thing. When ideas are initially competing for investment, mediocre ideas pitched well, beat out great ideas pitched poorly. Let me say that again. Mediocre ideas pitched well often beat out great ideas pitched poorly. And this is why I want to help people learn how to pitch, because I want to level the playing field so that the great ideas can stand out. <clears throat> Uh, the, the main point of today's whole thing is that basically I, I believe that when the best ideas win, we all benefit. Let me tell you a little bit about my background. I started in Hollywood as an intern on the movie Titanic, and then I moved to Jerry Bruckheimer Films where I worked on Armageddon, an enemy of the state, and Jerry would be very happy that I saw one of your conference rooms here is for The Rock. He would be very happy um, about that. Then I moved to MGM, where I was the director of creative affairs. And my job was basically to help supervise the development and production of films. And part of my job was hearing pitches from writers and directors. And over six years, I had more than 3,000 pitch meetings. And it was in those meetings that I really paid attention to what was working and what didn't. And I discovered that the best part of my job was working on pitches. So I decided to start my own company focused solely on pitching. Now, <clears throat> part of my business plan as I was starting my business was to write a book. And I was building my client base and I put together a book proposal and I had sent it to New York and got some interest of publishers. And so they invited me to come to New York. And I was like, great. OK, so I get to New York. I'm sitting in the lobby for my first meeting at this big publishing house. And suddenly, I started to get a little nervous. And I went into the meeting. And I was sitting there on this nice leather couch in this lovely office in Manhattan. And the editor, who I was expecting to come in with like a big friendly face and a you know, nice handshake, came in and said right to my face, I hate Hollywood and everything that it stands for. And I was a little taken aback. And I 
uh, was like, oh, okay. Um, and so then I started talking to him, and he basically grilled me for the entire meeting. We never got to my part of the pitch. Um, he basically was telling me that I represented everything that he hated about tabloid celebrity culture. And frankly, I was totally unprepared for that. I thought going into the meeting, oh, he's bought books that are similar to mine. He's, I'm prepared for the meeting. I can, you know, have a fine meeting. Um, but basically, I was stumbling and rambling, and it didn't seem like I knew at all what I was talking about. The irony was not lost on me that the book I was pitching was called Good in a Room, and I was not. So totally humbled, I had a few hours to regroup before my next meeting, and so I went back and I wrote down all the questions that he had asked me, and I developed better answers. I practiced out loud in the hotel room, you know, mirror, um, and I got myself ready for the mental stress of having to be on the spot. And my subsequent meetings went quite a bit better. They were far from perfect, but each time I got better. And by the end of the week, there were five publishers that made offers, and I sold my book to Random House. So uh, to tell you about my current clients, as you would expect, most of the people that I work with are still pitching TV and film projects. But I also, over the last five years, have branched out. And so I have worked with executives at... Merrill Lynch, Accenture, Mattel, Los Alamos National Laboratories, and also a wide variety of entrepreneurs. One of the entrepreneurs that I worked with very recently is, uh, has invented a new kind of airplane. And now why I share this is because I am not an engineer. I am not an aviation expert, but the ideas in his pitch are solely his own. But what I did is help take his ideas and make it so that other people could understand them and also see their value. And currently, he has secured his first round of financing and is developing a 65-pound prototype. Now, it's true that different fields have different criteria for evaluating ideas, but there are some things that are um, similar across a wide variety of situations. So before we get started, here's a fun fact. My brother Tim works here as a strategic partner development manager, so hello Tim. <laughs> um, and I know that this is an elite group. You guys have strong soft skills because you have made it through the rigorous and infamous Google interviewing process. I also know that there's a wide variety of jobs. There's engineers, there's people who work in ad sales, there's marketing, you know, you have, you encounter a bunch of different pitching scenarios. Um, but I think that there are some things that hold true through a wide variety of settings. So if you're in a more formal pitch, something like you're pitching to a major advertiser or partner, that's what I consider a more formal pitch, or you're presenting your ideas in the product review meeting or global product strategy meeting. Or there's plenty of more casual situations, like you're building consensus in a room of your peers, or you're talking to your uh, supervisor about your 20% project. Uh, all of these pitches basically are unique. That's something to know is that there's not a one-size-fits-all for how to pitch, but I'm really interested in that, those specific situations, so those little things like what, um, exactly what you say and how to say it in a specific situation, it's that fine-tuning that I really like, because it's often those small changes that you make that make the big difference. So let's talk about um, the wide variety of pitching situations. You have the formal situations and you have the more casual. And there are five techniques that I'm gonna to cover today that apply in that wide variety. And those are start by stepping back, write your pitch to be spoken, let the audience be the judge, sell yourself as well as your idea, and embrace pitching early in the development process. So let's start at the beginning. Uh, let's define three terms. First, pitch. People talk about pitch or pitching and mean lots of different things. 
I define pitching as verbally transferring information in order to get someone to act. Second, decision maker. The decision maker is the person who's listening to that pitch. And the decision is whether or not they're going to support your idea in some way. The third term is good in a room. Someone who pitches well to decision makers is good in a room. Someone, uh, this term originated in Hollywood, I didn't come up with it. Um, agents use it, coined it, to describe actors who are their, their most successful and their most charismatic. Those people are referred to as being good in a room. And uh, someone who's known for being good in a room is the actor Kevin Spacey. And I worked with Kevin on the movie 21, which, as you may know, was that film about the six MIT students who card counted at blackjack and won millions in Las Vegas. So I was working with Kevin and talking about how he first got his start. And what he did at the beginning, before he became a famous actor, is he would partner with writers who were good writers but felt really uncomfortable pitching. And so Kevin would go to the meeting with the writers, he would pitch the story and sell it, and then he would take a cut of the profits. So eventually, the writers who he was partnered with learned to successfully pitch on their own. And the point of this is that though there are some people who are born with a natural charisma, anybody, even shy, introverted people, can learn to become good in a room. So let's start at the beginning. <clears throat> the first um, technique is basically a key question when you're developing a pitch is where do you start? And in my experience, uh, a lot of pitches, most people start too far in, and that's why they don't get off to a good start. So we're going to start by stepping back is my first technique. Here's an example of what I mean. Last week, I heard a movie pitch from a writer, and he was saying to me, you know, Stephanie, my project is a pitch about a spy. And he's going along, he's describing the set pieces, he's talking about, you know, what's going to happen in the plot at each point. He's going along, and it's just not really adding up for me. So he's going along, and then he says, Stephanie, why aren't you laughing? <laughs> well, he was intending for the spy to be someone like Austin Powers from The Spy Who Shagged Me, but the whole time I was listening, I assumed he meant a serious operative like Jason Bourne from The Bourne Identity. So this could have easily been solved if he had just started with, my project is a comedy about dot, 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 a spy who does this. So I see the same kind of thing with the entrepreneurs that I work with. They start talking about their project. They know all the little details. They know the minutia. They know all these decisions that they've made. But when they start talking to someone else about their project, they don't provide the background that the person needs to understand. They don't contextualize the project within you know, that company's goals. They don't bring everybody in the room up to speed. And so they lose their audience. Now, <laughs> when you're thinking about where you should start when you want to start, you know, at the beginning, you don't have to start, uh, it, it's basically two or three steps back from what you're thinking. This doesn't mean you need to start with, first the earth cooled, then the dinosaurs came. But you do want to remember that context that for the person listening, they're hearing your idea for the very first time, and context lives in the mind of the listener. So start, this is why you want to start by stepping back. Assess what's happening. Um, <clears throat> what, what are that audience's expectations? Assess their level of expertise. And then start an, with an opening statement that makes it easy for them to understand your idea. OK, so we've started. We've covered start by stepping back. Now let's move to the second technique. Write your pitch to be spoken. What looks good on the page is very different from what sounds good in the air. And this is because of the way that listeners can absorb information. It's the pace at which they can absorb information. If you're presenting something in writing or you're reading it, that you can be very detailed. 
You can break up big units of information with bullets and headers and footnotes. Um, you can be very complex. And readers can skim. They can reread something that they're confused about. In a verbal pitch, the, the listener does not have that same level of control. So you want to be very um, careful about the level of detail that you share. <clears throat> and basically, uh, you, you, they can't rewind. They can't you know, figure out those sections uh, that are confusing to them. And they can't control the pace of the information that's coming um, at them. So this sounds really ridiculously basic. But one of the best ways that you can improve your pitch is to shorten your sentences. So where you see long sentences, break them up. If you're looking at you know, the pitch that you've prepared and you have a lot of commas, try periods instead. You want your se sentences to be short, crisp, and direct. It's OK if the information looks choppy and incomplete on the page as long as it sounds better in the air. OK, so we've covered start by stepping back and write your pitch to be spoken. Now we're going to go on to the third technique, which is let the audience be the judge. So now, why am I even talking about this? Of course, the audience is the judge. This is totally self-evident. But what I'm going to say may surprise you, because I'm going to recommend that you, do, that you avoid doing something that most people do. Most people, at some point in their pitch, tell the decision maker what to think or how to feel. Now, these are four things that I'm suggesting that you should not say. You're going to love this. I have an amazing idea for you. This project could be a game changer. This idea will revolutionize the industry. So now, what's the harm? These things show that you're confident, you're thinking big. You know, we know that decision makers like people who are enthusiastic and who, you know, demonstrate that they're passionate about their idea. So what's the problem? There are two main problems with this. One problem is that for high-level decision makers, they are hearing lots of pitches, and these phrases are so common that they make you blend in, not stand out. Every dog owner thinks their pet is adorable. Every parent, including me, thinks their child is brilliant. You are expected to be a fan of your own work, but you don't need to say it. Now, the second problem is more serious. That is that most decision makers don't want to be told how to think or feel, and they resent it if you do. So, for example, you're saying, you're going to love this. And in their mind, they're thinking, oh, really? You know exactly what's going on in my head. Or you say, you know, I have an amazing idea for you. And they think, seriously, you've concluded that your own idea is amazing. I'm stunned. So what I suggest is that you completely eliminate these sentences from your pitch. And instead, look for third-party validation. So the kinds of third-party validator that you're looking for is someone who has credibility with that decision maker. And now, this has a wide variety of applications. For example, I have a two-year-old son named Zach. And Zach was not eating his broccoli before I came on this trip. And I was like, Zach, broccoli is so delicious. He's like, no. And then I was like, but Zach, broccoli is going to make you healthy and strong. No. And then I thought, I'm going to look for a third-party validator. Zach, your friend Lucas loves broccoli. And then he tried it, and he liked it, and he ate it. So here's the point. Find credible experts, and if they support your idea, share their opinion, not yours. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the fourth technique, which is sell yourself as well as your idea. Many people feel uncomfortable with the whole idea of selling themselves. They don't want to brag or have to act fake or 
um, feel like they are being, you know, they seem self-absorbed in any way, and that's not what I'm suggesting. <clears throat> First, as you know, decision makers are not just investing in your idea, they're investing in you and your ability to bring those ideas to life. One of the most common pitfalls that I see is a lack of emphasis on the unique qualifications of the person or the people behind the pitch. Because decision makers know that there are going to be changes, obstacles, you know, issues along the way, and they want to know that you are uniquely qualified to be able to solve them. This means in the same way that you look at your pitch and you find the most compelling aspects of the project to talk about, you want to present yourself in the same way. And one of the best ways to do this is to answer the hidden question. In my experience, two decision makers ask two main kinds of questions when they're evaluating an idea or evaluating a pitch. The first kind of category in, is talking about the project. It's things like, what is this? What does it cost? Who is this for? What's the timeline? Those kinds of project-related questions are generally easier to answer. You can use research or data or statistics, and you can answer them directly. But the second kind of question is more complicated because it relates to you and your team. And often, what the decision maker is really asking is hidden behind another question. Here's an example. They'll ask you something like, how did you come up with this idea? Most people answer this question with, to describe the eureka moment, something like, I was in the shower and suddenly it came to me. But the decision maker is not asking you for exactly at what time on what day did you have this idea and what were you doing at the time. How or why did you come up with this idea is really a way of asking you what unique expertise or experience do you have that allowed you to see this opportunity. So a question, a good answer doesn't involve your shower, but rather is something more like, I've been obsessed with this question for nine years. I did my grad school thesis on it, and then I invested my own money to build a model. And once I built the model, my key insight came when I discovered that it was significantly more efficient than I thought, dot, dot, dot. You'll get common questions like, what are your goals? Or uh, what made you interested in this idea in the first place? Or what are some challenges that you, you know, are looking forward to? And in this case, when you hear questions like this, some general questions about you, pretend that the decision maker has asked you, do you have a story that exemplifies your expertise? Or how does your personal philosophy relate to our company's goals? Or even more directly, why should I trust you? Because that's what the decision maker really wants to know. Now, this isn't exact. It isn't like there's a specific hidden question behind every question that someone asks um, about you. But if someone asks you one of those questions about you or your team, it's an opportunity for you to sell yourself and your unique expertise, and you should use it. Now here's one way to create some great answers for those kinds of questions. Assess how you are different from the other people who do a similar job that you do. Think about some stories that you could share that exemplify your expertise. In other words, figure out why you are the best person to bring your idea to life, and then you can sell yourself as well as you sell your idea. Okay, so now we're going to move on to our fifth and final technique, which is embrace pitching early in the development process. So most people, well first let me define development. My definition of development is the process by which you take an initial idea and convert it into concrete plans that can be funded or implemented. 
Now, most people think of pitching as something that you do at the end of the de development process after you've already worked out your idea and now you're getting ready to sell it. And that's a lot of why people don't start working on their pitch until pretty much right before their big meeting. But the problem is that as soon as you start talking about your pitch out loud, inevitably, core problems to your main idea come out. But at that point, it's too late for you to do anything about it. So what I say, and it's really, really hard at that point to create a winning pitch once you know there are some serious problems with your idea. So I suggest that you bring the pitching much earlier up into the development of your idea. So start by any time that you have um, an idea that you think is worth considerable time or energy, I suggest that you take an hour and write a short pitch. Now a short pitch for your idea is simply a one to two sentence encapsulation of that idea. And the goal of this short pitch is to assess whether your idea is as good as you think it is, and if it needs work, where you can improve it. So you take this short pitch, and I would test it out on your friends or colleagues. When you've shared your short pitch with someone, here's what you're looking for as far as their feedback. Where did they nod or smile? Where did they frown? What questions did they ask you? What question did they ask you first? So then you get that feedback from your short pitch, you rework it, and you try it again. You know that you are on the right track if your short pitch enables someone to act. And here's what that looks like. It's like you, they hear the short pitch and your friend says, I'm in, how can I help? Or they say, oh, I know just the person that I want to put you in touch with. Let me call so-and-so on your behalf. So this is a high bar for a short pitch, that you're motivating someone to act. But actually, it's quite a reasonable one, because eventually, what your goal is, is that you share the pitch in such a way with a decision maker that they are motivated to act. So <clears throat> um, what I would say as far as um, a criteria or how you're figuring out whether your short pitch is ready to go, like whether you should take your short pitch and then continue developing the idea, is once you have the sense that your friends or colleagues want to support and help your idea, that then you know that you're headed in the right direction. So today we've covered five techniques. Start by stepping back, write your pitch to be spoken, let the audience be the judge, sell yourself as well as your idea, and embrace pitching early in the development process. Now, decision makers want you to succeed. They often say no, almost always say no, but they really want to say yes. They want you to come in with a great idea. They are really hoping, really hoping, that you have the answer that you have this compelling short pitch, that you have a great um, complete pitch that motivates them to act. They want to be thrilled by your ideas and they want to be thrilled by you. So much time could be saved and so much pain would be avoided if people with great ideas learned how to pitch. I have seen this work inside and outside of Hollywood and my clients who work at it sell TV shows, sell movies, and secure financing for their entrepreneurial ventures. Now, I hope that these five techniques have helped you to become better in a room, because when the best ideas win, we all benefit. Thank you. So now I would love to hear um, any questions that you might have specific or in general. Yes, in the front. I'm going to bring the microphone over to you if that's okay. okay. You want me to speak? Oh, sure. So in terms of like pitching in Hollywood and around you know entertainment properties, it seems like the elevator pitch is like this idea of like a very fixed short period of time that you have to actually pitch to people. Like, what do you think are your best 
uh, tactics in terms of like getting your idea across in a really short period of time or is that just like a misconception and you actually have like an hour to really sit down and, and lay out like in a very well paced form like what your idea is? Okay, so the question was about the elevator pitch. And I am, uh, one, I think you only do have a short time to make someone, you know, to make a positive impression. So I think that is still true. And I think that time period is getting shorter and shorter and shorter as far as people's attention span and how much information is coming at them. But I am totally against the idea of an elevator pitch for a few reasons. One, the term elevator pitch I don't like because I think it gives you the sense that you're actually supposed to pitch someone in an elevator, which I totally don't like. I don't think that you should ever pitch someone um, when you just have a moment of access with them. That access is not the time to actually share a great idea where they could move forward with it and say, you're a legitimate um, someone that I really want to do business with. The elevator, is, that's never going to be the right um, situation. It also, the term elevator pitch makes you think that you should just pitch to anyone who you see in an elevator because I believe that especially high level buyers are expecting a level of customization and that an effective pitch is customized to that specific person and to that specific situation, exactly what their needs are, exactly who that person is. And an elevator pitch that's one size fits all, I tell everyone my elevator pitch and everyone can inherently tell that this is the same thing that you say when someone asks you, you know, what are you doing or what are you working on? People know that it's generic and it's one size fits all and no one wants to feel that they want to feel like they're special and you've customized this solution just for that specific scenario. Other questions? Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, I'm supposed to stay over here, but I'll, I'll, I'll respond or you can come over if you want to. Okay, so the question, well, one, I'm very happy to be here, so thank you. Um, but also, uh, the question was about data and how to effectively include data in your pitches. Um, and for me, if it's just a verbal pitch, like if you're just talking to someone over the phone, data is really hard to convey effectively. So I think you want to be very careful about the amount of numbers and statistics and things that you quote. But a lot of times I know, and I know that they do here, use pitch decks. And for me, a philosophy of dealing with a pitch deck is that you are the pitch. Your pitch deck is not the pitch. So thinking of you being the lead and that your pitch deck is just singing backup. So only using the pitch deck for ways where there's maybe a more visual way to convey that information more effectively than talking. But when you are there in person, people, they can get so much more information from you, a human who's talking and making eye contact and reacting to the situation and making it customized so much more than anything, statistics, numbers, um, and all the other data that you have. So I think um, thinking one, Another question that I would ask is, if there's only one piece of data that you want them to remember, often decision makers don't make the decision right there in the room that they have to tell someone else. So you're, not, you're no longer there in the pitch, but they have to re-pitch it to someone else. So thinking, what is that story? Or what is that one amazing statistic that they'll remember that they can use to re-pitch why they need to be in business with Google or why they need to do this specific thing? Other questions? Yeah, Mike. So you talked in the beginning about a lot of bad ideas, a lot of bad ideas making it through and being successful. So I'd love to learn more about pitching bad ideas because I have a lot of those. <laughs> but um, actually, um, <laughs> um, sorry. Um, what I'm really curious is like, do you spend the time to put yourself in the shoes? Like taking a step back is one approach, but thinking about your audience in a different way, like you know, you're pitching to a movie executive, should you try to put your hat on and pretend that you're them in a way? Or how do you go about like figuring out how to present to the audience appropriately? 
Okay, so how I figure out the audience is actually I do a lot of actually putting myself in that person's shoes, that specific person, researching them. What can I find out about them? Because if I'm, I mean, you, to use a Hollywood example, if I'm pitching a romantic comedy, my pitch might be different if I know that person, the executive I'm going into, is right in the midst of a divorce versus if that person is planning their wedding and they're really excited about it. So I might customize the the movie pitch in some way, not that I'm changing the what actually happens in the movie, but just how I'm positioning it as context in the beginning of that pitch. And I they think that there's a lot of ways that you can do that um, totally outside of Hollywood of figuring out, okay, do I know that this person, about what age do I guess they are? Are they male or are they female? Do I know that they've been at the company a long time? If I'm putting myself in their shoes, for that specific decision maker, because really all that it matters is the person who makes the decision, can I guess from what I know about them or their company that they would benefit from, you know, at what time of the year would it be great for them to be able to sign a huge new client or have provide this huge solution that's going to make them look like a hero to their supervisor so that they get promoted, they get a better job, they get a raise, they're thrilled, they're happy, and they're thrilled with you and want to keep working with you because you help make them, that specific person, look good. So I do think about all those um, specific scenarios, especially when there's a lot at stake. If it's a really high stakes meeting and there's a lot of money at stake that could make a huge difference to your quarter, your year, that's where I'm really taking the time. Of course, you can't do that with every single phone call. But when there's a lot at stake, I do spend a lot of time putting myself in that decision maker's shoes. Other questions? Yeah. Great. Thank you as well for coming by. Um, I have a question about your final point about uh, pitch, starting the pitch, thinking about the pitch early in the development. And one thought I had, or a question I have is, um, is, there, is there a problem with people latching too hard onto like ideas that are in the pitch and unable to sort of de-anchor off of those ideas? You know, if they start thinking of it as a comedy, for example, in the film, and they, they you know, and the idea isn't gelling that way, and you know, they drift like, you know, if we made this, you know, something else, then they realize, oh, that would work. But it's hard for them to sort of break free of those original pitch ideas, those original sort of elements in there. Is that a, an issue you've seen, and are there ways to avoid that? I think it is. Uh, you bring up a really good point. It is absolutely an issue that I see, and I think that it's another reason for pitching earlier in the process, because it's one thing if you've had an idea and you're working on it for three weeks, and then someone suggests a major change, or if you've been working on that for three years, and then someone suggests a change, and you're like, no, that is not possible, that we're doing it this specific way. So I think that brings the point of pitching earlier. Um, there are plenty of examples of, in Hollywood where they think studio executives, and I say this as a former studio executive, give terrible notes, and that writers basically hate um, the studio executives who are telling them how to change their project. And one of my clients uh, was pitching to a famous producer, and he was pitching a romantic comedy to star an actress like Kate Hudson. And he's in the meeting with this big producer, and the producer says, I love the story, keep everything the same, but change the lead to a male chimpanzee. <laughs> and he was like, um, but he was good. Instead of saying, no, that's the most ridiculous, horrible idea I've ever seen in my entire life, he was like, you know, let me think about it. That's something I hadn't considered. <laughs> and ultimately, uh, they got to work together, and now he has a two-picture deal with that producer. So even with the most ridiculous, you know, ideas, sometimes you can still save the relationship. Other questions? Hello, VCers. Any questions? Yes, you have a question. Mind, but it's more about 
I think that that's true. I think that um, perhaps the, the question was about whether when you're talking about selling yourself, especially in your particular situation, is when I talk about selling, my, selling yourself that perhaps it's more important to focus on how you sell Google as the solution. And I think that for those ideas, some will work more for certain jobs and others. Or if you're you know, having an entrepreneurial, you're pitching your startup, that's perhaps where it's more important. But I think that if you are um, forming a relationship with a particular partner and you're going to be the contact, that I think that they do want to know that there's a human face to this ginormous, famous company. And so the more that you demonstrate that you are a real person and also that you're, you know, that you're, 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 they're not, um, you can play with the stereotype or their expectations of Google in a nice way where you can say, you know, obviously we are the 800 pound gorilla in this area, but I am a real person here. And here's, here's some ways that I've worked with another partner, you know, another company similar to yours who had this kinds of concern, or share something about your personal background, where you're from, a story from your childhood, from college of how you, you know, had a specific way to solve the solution so that they know that there's a, a real human face, because I think that that's, um, I could imagine that being a concern for someone from the outside. Other questions? Anything else? All right, well thank you so much and I'm happy if those of you have specific questions or a specific situation you wanna do a little um, gaming, I would be happy to you know, talk to you in more specific or if you wanna email me, I'm really available. So thank you so much for having me, this has been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.